Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz, and today on Who Is, we're just discussing who is the greatest woman's wrestler of all time. Of course, with me in the booth is Mr. J himself, the Dr. Michael Jargo. Jargo, how are you doing today, sir? Doing fantastic, man. Good to see you, Paz. Good to see you, Huckleberry. Been looking forward to today's episode. We've been trying to get Paz to sit down and do this one for a while, and he finally caved in. Also happy to see that, Paz, we were right. Ric Flair won the poll on Twitter for greatest promo of all time. It's very, very cool stuff happening here at Who Is? Yes, and the third man in the booth. The Corolla Sun Toyota man himself, Mr. HMG, Mr. TMPT, Mr. RBV. Rick, what's going on today, sir? Uh, gentlemen, great to be back with you again for uh, another round, another epic round of who is looking forward to, uh, I guess, I guess this, uh, this debate, if you will, as we run down the resumes of some of the greatest female performers. Uh, I do. I do want to emphasize that we are talking about female performers. And the history, uh, the illustrious history of professional wrestling. So Flair, like uh, Mr. J had mentioned there, he won the greatest promo the week before. Mr. Perfect won IC champ online, of course, the the consensus Twitter vote. Sometimes they could be a little wonky. I know Rick disagreed because Cornette didn't win uh, for promo, but hey. And I was a little upset that Honky Tonk Man didn't win Intercontinental. But hey, you know, th those are the breaks sometimes. Sometimes the fans... Are the overwhelming majority sometimes that they're a little, uh, maybe a vocal minority? So it, it is what it is. But as far as today, we're talking about the greatest women's wrestlers ever. When I was first writing this list, I was like, man, this is going to be tough. I'm just, I'm just because I'm not really that familiar too much with female wrestling just in general. Like, I know Jargo, you're telling me about all Japan women's wrestling. And I know if you look online, Meltzer gave a ton of matches, five stars. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, I'm very familiar with maybe some more current day women's wrestling. But like the grand scheme of things and the grand scope, the first name I thought of and the first person when I think of women's wrestling was the fabulous Moolah. Was that uh, the case for you, Jargo? Uh, no, I, I do have Moolah on my list, but I have Moolah way down on my list. Um, and it, Moolah is an interesting one because you have to try to separate what you think of the person that Mula was versus the wrestler and the performer that Mula was right. Um, I mean, w when you talk about somebody that's champion for decades, it's hard to not put them on the list, but in a weird way, w you, you bring up that you thought this list was going to be very difficult to make. That largely is in part due to Mula. Like Mula held back women's wrestling for about 30 years, in my opinion, you know? So does that qualify her for the list? Absolutely. But there's a lot of other names that I probably should be on that list. But Mula gets a bit of this revisionist WWE history about how fabulous she really was. I think, you know, starting off here with Mula, obviously, what a tremendous jumping in point is especially for you know of of fans of the wrestlemania era the, that true modern era of pro wrestling she kind of was always that that defining figure when we talked about women obviously as we have you know light has come upon the personal side the the backstage behind the curtain dealings that she was involved with that perception has greatly changed but when we look at you know what more what she brought to the table what she meant to the professional wrestling business itself what she meant as a uh, as a performer it, it really we have to look at the era the time that she was framed in uh and we're and as we talk about so many of these other incredible talents that's going to regularly come up about how you know these female talents are you know as wrestlers as performers are perceived how they're utilized and, you know, it really, what, what are the agendas in the marketing behind women in wrestling? Uh, that, that's going to be a key factor as we determine, you know, who's going to top this list and, and really how we rank these individuals, where they're at. It's really crazy. If you go, you know, you, you guys probably jump off on, you know, and when we start researching for these things each week, you do a simple Google of who is whatever that topic is to see what other articles have suggested, how they're ranked. What's incredible to me is when you go look at these great rankings of female performers, wrestlers, whatever the case might be there, it's a lot of active, a lot of modern day because of 
more of the agenda of what we're perceived. Uh, and I, and I think that's going to be a, you know, a huge part of this conversation, but absolutely, uh, you know, at a time where women's wrestling was an absolute attraction and, and that's, you know, they were pretty much on the posters back then alongside the midgets. You'd get them a few times in your territory. They weren't actively used throughout the show. You didn't see them in, in really in a, in a whole lot of manager roles, unless it was really just for that, that kind of eye candy. I mean, even Mula herself began in that, correct? I mean, was she, was she Jungle Girl when she came in? So and it, Jungle it Lady or whatever, yeah. Yep. What it, yeah, it, yeah so, whatever, yep. So those roles have changed and evolved, and we're going to have to kind of weigh those against each other as we're talking. Uh, I think there is a great spot for Mula. Uh, and one of the things that's amazing when you hear, you know, and she had to, she had to cut her teeth training with guys because there wasn't a, a large number of other females to get in there and train with, uh, you know, until she really started bringing some in, into the business. We don't really want to bring up too much of like what she did behind the scenes, guilty or, or innocent of it, but in, in like in front of the camera, in front of the screen, that big undefeated streak, quote unquote, undefeated streak champion forever. I mean, she was presented as if she was the greatest, you know I mean? Like it, it presented like she's this big legend, um, obviously pretty good wrestler, that kind of uh, old school tough style where she wasn't doing, you know, flips and <laughs> anything of that nature. I mean, she's pretty yeah. hard hitting, especially for woman style, but it's just one of those things where the way she was presented on TV, it's an absolute legend. It's like, wow, she's undefeated. Which, you know, she's impossible to defeat. You know, she, basically the Andre the giant if you will of women's wrestling to me the more damning thing about Mula is that Mula was trusted with the book for women's wrestling for a very very long time which is why she was on top for so long right of course there's there's so many much politics that go into Mula and how she held down other women I mean because Everything that you have ever heard about the fabulous Mula and how great she was and how inspirational she was and all that, that false narrative really, to me, belongs to the number two on my list, Mildred Burke, um, who basically, she came before Mula. She was trying to make women's wrestling a legitimate part of the show. She was out there wrestling, dude. She was doing intergender matches in the 1930s. She wrestled 200 men and only lost once. She'd go out there and have an actual shoot match with some of these other ladies if they were getting too damn sassy back behind the scenes. Like Mildred Burke was a real badass who was out there trying to bring women's wrestling into the forefront. Whereas when Mula got a hold of women's wrestling, she made it all about the fabulous Mula. When I interviewed uh, Mad Maxine, she had mentioned, you know, a lot, a lot of the other stuff with Mula. But the one thing that I was kind of curious about just from like a political standpoint was Mad Maxine was supposed to be on Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. All of a sudden, Muda, Mula ends up on there. But it was weird. It's like, how did she get on there? Well, kind of move her out, like just to get to the point of where you're saying kind of keeping herself on top. Well, if you move this person out here. Oh, hey, by the way, I'm here, Vince or, or whoever, you know. Uh, whoever's you know in charge of putting that show together like i'll be on it like oh that was mula perfect well, i mean is it, it is it fair to really hold that in in any sense against mula when i mean that's just the code of the business at the time i mean it just wasn't something unique to her that she's holding down these other women like, like, I mean, that, like that's she, across the board i mean we saw you know right she might have been the mentor women. of hulk hogan the way that she was holding other people back <laughs> that, where do you on. think hogan learned it from come on with uh mildred burke though legit you know tough girl i mean legit badass uh and obviously the precursor to mula really kind of the the mentor if you will to, to mula as far as is that's concerned i know um rick is probably going to say his next person is just keeping in with the old school june byers another uh, big big legend i know rick was going to mention that next oh absolutely and you're talking about and what's is and as we are what we have in this modern, and I know we're going to get to some of the current things that's going on, what the evolution and, and, you know, and how that kind of still lingers on, you know, with, with their marketing plans and all that. And that's, that's what it should have been built around it is people from that era that were true. Yeah. I mean, that really was, that's what embodied the mindset of, we have got to get away from this last this last little run where we're bikini models, we're sex symbols. We are here. We are cutting our teeth. We are in the gym. We are we are breaking boundaries. What old is new. 
That's what they should have embraced. And again, then you're teaching history. You're getting people more involved, that learning process. They're more invested in the art of professional wrestling, sports entertainment, however you want to go about it there. That's where they greatly miss their cue. Instead of that, they try to go back to the mula thing. That ultimately backfires on them. And then they completely lose track of the direction with the women's evolution. And we're kind of at where we're at today with it. I mean, to me, what I, Mildred Burke is one of the most fascinating characters throughout like pro wrestling history to me. And, and it's mostly because when you think of what the women go through today and the way that some people talk about the women of today, imagine it being 1935 and the number of guys that are going to get into a ring with somebody like Mildred Burke and try to take advantage of the situation. And then Mildred Burke would whip their ass. Like that woman was a legitimate badass that I, I feel like I want to see a movie about Mildred Burke, you know, like she's just a fascinating personality throughout the course of wrestling history. Well, I think it, it, you talk about, you know, here's we truly do. We have the carnival aspect. This is where they're coming from. She's trying to, to break into this thing and absolutely unheard. I mean, what an absolute embarrassment for, you know, for any male to get in there to get shown up here. Uh, hell, you know, at this time, just going in there and even kind of just lock up with her would have been troubling for a lot of these guys to get over that ego. There's paydays here. Hey, but outside of that, you want the drama of professional wrestling? You think there's theatrics today? Go back and look at her life. Right. I mean, her husband, was it Wolf? That was the big promoter that was involved in scandal after scandal. Yeah. And then she ended up breaking away from him and had to recarve her own path through the NWA. Like it's a fascinating story. It, yeah. It's just absolutely incredible. And I wish that, places like the wwe would actually embrace that stuff more and because like they do such a great job with their documentaries i'd love to see stuff like that i don't need to see vincent kennedy mcmahon versus the united states no, and the on, dramatization no, the they're the gonna united make states attacking vincent vincent kennedy McMahon. <laughs> i mean it's I'm, just i'm all over that i'm loving that i want i want to see that I, it, oh my it's, you're, you're drinking a kool-aid pause it's gonna be so incredibly skewed it's gonna I, be incredible i love kevin dunn uh, I'm all over that. I want to. No, see. Yeah, I'm with Jargo on this. I mean, this, you know, you know what I was just mentioned. This is what they should have been focusing on. These are the documentaries you want to talk about women empowerment. This is right? the, the, the story to tell. I don't even know if I want WWE to have their hands on this. I want some outside production. I, I want this to become a series. I want this, you know, give me a dramatic series out of this from someone that knows what the hell they're doing. Well, and I mean, even Moolah, the way that they portray Moolah now throughout history, like they can't wait to talk about the Attitude Era stuff. Like they don't do, they don't even go back and actually tell Moolah's history. They just kind of pick it up in like, you know, 1996. Well, what about, it, it, what it about a lot when she was loving grandmother Moolah? Right. What about Johnny Mae Young? Yeah. And, and Mae Young is another. It's it's weird to me that we can't mention Mula without Mae Young at this point, given kind of their history coming up together, right? Mm -hmm. um, I I think personally, Mae Young belongs higher on this list than Mula does. Rick, what do you think? I would agree with you one hundred percent. Is you're saying it's it's almost impossible to have a conversation with someone without mentioning the other, and through that revisional history, we kind of put. Uh, May Young is that sidekick a little bit, is the Robin to the Batman. But to me, uh, it's the other way around, where she actually was the the more talented, uh, bigger star. But but again, you know, it goes to the politics game. Uh, it is the cut the cut cutthroat reality of professional wrestling, and back then, ever so more true than it is today. And hey, believe me, we're seeing it today. A lot of people don't realize what's truly going on behind the scenes there, uh, how petty the political game is. Yeah, but I would put May Young higher than Mula here in our conversation. Well, but if you do perception, though, the perception and the way it's presented is that Mula was the bigger star, though. That's because Mula had the book. But I'm saying, though, like just it just like casual fan just looking at it, it's like, oh, like Rick said, it's like she Batman was definitely the Robin. Robin. Yeah, it definitely Mula was presented as if she was. Now, the now you could even tell, I mean, anybody. You know, going back to the attitude era, as we said, where we get really seriously reintroduced to these these individuals and they really take on a persona. They, they really evolve that persona. They, they are those bigger characters. We especially see them through the attitude era. 
I would ask you guys there. I mean, they regularly told us how great Mool is, and she was the, the trailblazer and, and held the title for five five decades or, you know, <laughs> undefeated. No one could dethrone her. And uh, she was the one that anyone that came in the business had to go through to get where they were going. Go back and, and watch with fresh eyes. I remember the thoughts watching it back there when, it, when I was in my teens, high school years and all that, and, and, and realizing – May Young's the more gifted individual of these two. Yeah, she had a better camera presence. Uh, she she was she was more engaging. She pulled you in. You believed a little more in what she, what she was projecting, uh, much more than Mula. Mula always felt very uncomfortable to me when it came to the modern presentation, especially when we you kind of geared towards sports entertainment. I I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. I I always thought that Mae Young was a better performer, and it, it's unfortunate that it wasn't really until the Mae Young Classic where they really got into who Mae Young actually was, other than Mula's sidekick. Like the, the only thing that ever hurt Mae Young is that she was so loyal to Mula, she was always subservient to Mula, even in the Attitude Era. You know, like she was still playing number two to Mula's number one. And I think with, you know one of and one of the things too. It's a, sorry, cut you off your pause. With with May Young, that we really uh, have to really just stand up and applaud her for what was the dedication to entertaining. She had realized where the business had gone, how how much it had changed, you know, since she had broken into it, and and to sit there and just embrace embrace the ideas of you know the the relationship angle with Mark Henry, uh, going out there and telling the Dudleys, <laughs> don't hold back. You put me through that table like you would any of the boys. And what was she at that time? 80 something years old. Right. <laughs> and she said, bring it to me. I mean, she craved that stage, that spotlight. She, she absolutely was consumed in the absolutely loved professional wrestling and the evolution of sports entertainment. And that's something you just ultimately have to admire. With the, uh... Johnny May Young, obviously, like I was going to mention too, the Attitude Era uh, stuff, uh, her giving birth to a hand. She <laughs> she'll do anything. I mean, she she just did didn't care. She'll go out there naked if need be. It's like a joke. I mean, she just uh, did not. Yeah, care. I, for, I forgot like, about the um the, <laughs> like, uh, diddy shot we got that one. Yes, Good I mean, God. so she just. Uh, just a, a testament to her. She just doesn't care. She'll do whatever it takes. Um, she she was an addict. She was an addict for the spotlight. She loved it. Kind of in the same breath as we talk about Mula, as we talk about Mae Young, pause. I'm surprised that you haven't brought up the female Hulk Hogan yet, Wendy Richter. Where does she Ooh. fall on your list? She's on my list. Yeah, I had her pretty high because I thought that she was going to be the next Mula. You know, she was going to dethrone her and, and basically become that for the WWF. Obviously, there's some politics and some other things that were going around that kind of didn't really happen for her. And even some of the boys in the back that didn't like some of the reactions that she was getting. And so, you know, so as the rumors say that they kind of try to hold her back or hold her down a little bit because like, Hey, she can't be getting a better reaction than me or Hey, she's getting almost uh, as big as reaction. As some of the guys are like, Oh, only Hogan's out popping her. You know, you, you hear yep. stories like that about her. So she almost sh could have, should have definitely been bigger than what she was, but I had a pretty high on my list just for the fact that, she was almost there. She was at the precipice, you know, WrestleMania won everything, but it just didn't quite happen for the longevity portion for her. She should have been the female Hulk Hogan, but right. instead what happened? The fabulous Mula. Right. Yeah. I was, she came from that camp and I'm really trying to, you know, kind of remember back to, because it, you know, it seemed behind her. And I think that, you know, when we mentioned Mula and having the book and that, and that control freak, and being able to manipulate the powers that be, you know, on that stage of WWF, you know, they, they did kind of make a commitment. They saw that reaction. They saw that there might be some value, some money in backing this division. Uh, remember, because they went out and they built themselves a nice little roster that they were they were running out there regularly. Uh, then it almost like, boom, just came to a standstill. And it was just, okay, now we're back to special attractions here. It makes a lot of sense, you know, is you look at that push, they're bringing in these kind of going the Hulk Hogan route where they're looking for these other just massive monsters that they can come in and line up against this baby. Oh, my God. How, how is she going to overcome these immeasurable odds this time around? It was almost that same formula. I think Mullah saw that writing on that wall and said, well, I, I, I need to get back in this spot. 
because of the money that was going to be had, even if it was, you know, a quarter of what Hawkamania was producing, you're talking about some serious cash flow. And that single decision moved women's wrestling back in time about 20 years. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it completely, uh, you began running on quicksand. Uh, it stalled everything and, and it sank. That that could have been really a great boom for women's wrestling and absolutely stalled. I feel like she definitely could have been that next, you know, big breakout star, the next Hogan. Like a, She a, should have been the female to... equivalent of Hogan. That's what she should have been. What do you think about, like, let's just say current day wrestling, because I think that's kind of where it emanated from as far as just wanting to do this list is it's a lot of the people saying Charlotte Flair. I mean, like you're saying, it, it held the business back for years. Now we're in present day. What about Charlotte Flair as the greatest women's wrestler? Because that's kind of where this emanated. Oddly enough, somebody said it online and MVP shot it down in a blaze of glory <laughs> who works with her and the WB shot her down in a blaze of glory. I know it's, I think much too soon and much too young to say she's the greatest, but it's interesting. All these people online, because that's what they do. They say, whatever's happening right now is the greatest. Um, you know, these are the same people that foolishly said, Oh, LeBron James, cause he's one of the best players today. He's the greatest of all time. It's like, give me a break. Come on, get, get, get real guy. He's not even the, the best player in the last 20 years. I mean, get serious people. But, uh, what do you think about Charlotte Flair? Too much too soon here? Why are people saying she's the greatest? And then and I, Rick, uh, please. I know you're going to say she is, but please. Here, here, Rick, let, I, I will say, let me say this before you yeah. go off about your love for Charlotte Flair. Um, if this show was who has had the best push of all time, Charlotte Flair might be in that conversation. Oh, no, no. Well, we just talked about the greatest push of all time. Mola she gave it to himself. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Very true. True. Okay, you know when Charlotte gets up there to a, a reign of five hundred plus days, okay, then we'll start talking about maybe she's in that conversation there. Uh, and this gets back to what I opened about how we're gonna have to look at these different eras, what the agendas are, how are they are being perceived, and how they are being pushed. What you had there were Charlotte, and Charlotte is the is the best of her group. Uh, I'd say arguably at this very moment, arguably, I don't, I don't know if she is the best in the world, but in the last, within the last 10 years, I don't want to say 10, six years. I think she has really shown her, you know, really shown just how athletic, incredibly athletic she is. She's naturally gifted. I mean, she was born into this thing and, and she's dedicated herself to it. And she's done an amazing job where she is at right now. But that's also based around why we get those conversations. Is it Charlotte? Is it a is it a Becky Lynch, a Sasha, all that kind of that group that came when we first got the evolution, when they started pushing this idea on us. And inside of that, outside of a few flashes of the mentions of Moolah and Mae Young, they led you to believe that all other professional wrestling for women was garbage. Uh, and then they had to start breaking down a little bit because – it just wasn't – people were seeing through the PR agenda. So then they had to start recognizing some greats from the eras that they were kind of chastising. You know, they they realized, okay, you know, we, we've got to start, you know, re-mentioning Trish because these fans remember her. We've got to start talking about Lita. we got to start talking about Beth Phoenix. We've and, – and from that whole group, and even be, before that, there was an incredible lineup of women performers that I would put far beyond and before on this list than I would so many from this modern crop that we have today. Uh, you know, one that, that I would say is, is the best in the world that doesn't get an, a true opportunity to shine. And, and it's, we're talking about a performer and now overall business, she's about ready to step up to the plate and I'm sure going to hit a home run extra excited coming up here. Mickey James, as she goes and she's going to take the, the production role here for the empower. Uh, she's still going. She is, she's up there amongst one of the all-time greats. Uh, for today that are going, uh, Deeb, simply incredible. I, I think they're just – and I know there's a handful, uh, one that really jumps up, Julia over in, in Japan, that, that are absolutely killing it right now. Uh, but it, I think it's about how the fans have been spooned and fed that women's pro wrestling before this just can't hold a candle to what you're getting now, and that's just – it's not true. Do you think, agree with the the Charlotte 
Becky, Sasha, with all these people online saying that they're the best athletes in the women's division of all time. No, do you even do you even agree with that? I guess not. Not whatsoever. I in out of out of this this that crop there that you're mentioning. I'll really say okay. Anyone? How long has Charlie been around here? Uh, six six seven years. years. Well, what are we at? WrestleMania 38, so she got throughout 32. So let's say five, six years. So anybody within this within this five years right now that we're talking about being at their very best of their game, Charlotte might be the one that could stand out going back to the late 90s, let alone getting into the feuds with Lita and, and Trish. Um, I mean, because you got so many damn good names back then, from, from Jacqueline to Luna. To Ivory, to Holly, uh, some of them that, that I've just I, that I can't, and that's just in ring performance. When we're talking about those eras again, we got to take. I mean, we got to take the whole the whole kabang here, because a lot of times they didn't have a huge opportunity to go out there. You had to make the most of what you could inside of your of your belt of your ring time, but you had to be other things on screen. You had to be manager. You, you had to work interview. You had to be involved in skits. It's not about the movesets of Professor Ray. It's about the personas and characters. And that's where that's where they really make the difference here. This new group today, they just don't seem to get that. I also had a Charlotte for those that but she but she was around back then. Uh she was there for you know the straight edge society, Deeb, who reinvented herself and had to refine herself. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the thing with Charlotte is she's a flair. And that helps an awful lot. Like, I feel like Charlotte really benefits from that because Charlotte is going to go down in WWE history as the greatest of all time. Like, they're going to make damn sure of that, the way that she is booked, right? right. She wouldn't have that booking if she wasn't Ric Flair's daughter. Like, I, I think she would still be there. I think Charlotte's that talented. But the push and the way that she is presented – has a lot to do with being Ric Flair's daughter. Like, well, I, I think Charlotte's really, really good, but I don't think she's that great. Well, you know, even outside of that, if she wasn't Flair's daughter, I don't think she would be there because she never would have pursued professional wrestling. It well, wasn't until right. Reeves passing, you know, that, you know, to go follow that dream. She might have found her way there eventually, you know, realizing, hey, I, I don't know. I know she was good, uh, but how far do you make it in volleyball? So there might not have been other things there. And then her dad's still involved. She's around it. She's she's talking to people, you know, would have been pulled into this thing. But who knows? You brought up this crop. And I, I think, like, Bailey, Sasha, Becky, Charlotte, they all four have to, like, and they all make the list, right? And if you take the four horsewomen together – as like a conglomerate, they might actually be pretty high as far as influence goes between the four of them. But yeah. of the four of them, I rank Becky as the highest. I mean, it, Becky did something that Charlotte's never done, and that's get herself over. I, I would argue that no, that, that it helps here because getting yourself over in that sense is because they were looking for somebody other than Charlotte. And, 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 and Becky got over in a half-ass attempt. They could have slapped kind of that stone-cold half-ass act on anybody, and that was going to work there. But they put it on Becky, and it worked. And of, of like, when we talk about, like, this era of women's wrestling, Becky Lynch and that run as the man, has there been a female that got hotter in the business that you remember? Hotter in the business. Where was the crossover appeal? I mean, it, it, that's why I, I say it was such a piss poor, stone cold act. Did it, did it shatter boundaries? Were their new fans fly? You know, you were talking last week when we were talking promos, pulling people into the arena, talking people to the box office. Yeah, but we're talking about an era where nobody does that. I, so she, if she's so what elite, about, then shouldn't she rise above that? I, I just, I, I think that she's, inc and I think she did a terrible, and it could be all creative as well, because they didn't really give her a whole lot to work with. Uh, but I just, I just think the whole man thing is so over, so overly exaggerated because the rest of the product was so bad. It, it's another case of where, because it's so bad that mediocre is accepted as excellence. 
What about Sasha Banks being on Star Wars? Well, that's another creative in marketing just totally dropping the ball that they refused to play to that. You have an opportunity. And here's another thing. When you talk about somebody who can get themselves over that has some kind of a appeal and connection with fans, I don't absolutely understand it. But Sasha Banks from the get-go, people love her. And I don't it, get it at all. I mean, she's best when she's Ratchet Sasha. I mean, I think Jargon, you're the one that dubbed her that there. Yep. She just comes off to me as like this unlikable, total just bitch of a person. I'm sorry. There's people nothing likable about Sasha Banks when to she's us, a heel. To us, but people, you know, when she's playing that heel, but people absolutely love her. Uh, I think if she had a little bit more mentorship, stronger coaching, uh, with ring style and how to craft her persona. To me, that's the one that could have been an incredible breakout star uh, of the four. Well, and then there's Bailey. Like, is there a bigger ball drop in the history of professional wrestling than Bailey was? I mean, like that, that was the female John Cena ready to go. And then she got to the main roster and Vince McMahon got a hold of her and it was over in about a week. You know, I like how you what you said, you know, going back to just a second there, Jogger. You, you said individually, we can't really put them up there at the top of these greatest female performers in history. But that as a coll- but that is a collective, they truly embodied what that current evolution, that movement represented, what they wanted to gain out of that. If they really just would have understood, we need to take these four and, and hitch the wagon to these horses these horse women and and ride it all the way through to you know to the new promised land absolutely they would have had something incredible unfortunately what happened with the evolution and all this is it, it turned out to be more about lady balls and the brand unless your name's mcmahon you'll never rise above the brand uh and it really ended up being more detrimental I believe to and, and going out there and continuing and, and instead of letting them pave a path of their own, it was okay. You repeatedly have to go out there and go as fast as you can to prove that you can do everything that the guys can do. Now kind of moving on here. Let's talk about some of the Japanese greats. Uh, Bull Nakano was on my list. Aja Kong was on my list. Also, uh, Miami Toyota, who a lot of people were saying were the greatest MVP, who kind of started this argument to begin with, he said that Toyota was the greatest. What do you think, Jargo? I said on Twitter when we, we kind of put out that this was going to be the topic for this week, there is one answer, and the correct answer is Monami Toyota. Um, if you go back and watch what she was doing in the late 80s, in the early 90s, all throughout the 90s, she is the Ric Flair of professional wrestling where she just feels so far ahead of everything else that is going on. You could, if you could drop a uh, in her prime Monami Toyota right now on the main roster, she would still be the best professional wrestler on that roster. She would just, she was absolutely incredible. Debuted in 1987 at the age of 16 retired in 2017. So you had a 30 year run for Monami Toyota, where she was working on top. First championship in 89, tag league winner five times with five different partners. She won the All-Japan version of the G1 four different times. She was in the era of All-Japan women. She was the standard when All-Japan women were basically the only professional wrestling that was performing well inside of Japan. Everybody knows Monami Toyota is the greatest of all time. It's just like it, like it is just understood. Now, now hold on there. Hold on. You, you mentioned something. Tag league five times with five different partners. That that just says that she was so disliked she couldn't even find anyone that wanted to team up with her more than than once. They were you know done. what? I'm happy that you bring that up because. It, let's talk about that with Charlotte and Rick for a second, right? Like they're always talking about like, Oh, she's an 11 time champion. That means that you've lost the title 10 times. Like how good are you? Good God. Hey, anyone can get gotten, but can you get it back? Now, Jorgo, 
you know, maybe, maybe in one of the things I had to go do research here on a number of these names, when, you know, cause I know when we're talking about all time women, cause it is, it's much more prominent. It's so different when we go to the East for professional wrestling, you're more invested over there. You're more involved. You're hip to the scene. Can you tell us a little bit about is you, you know, she broke Toyota broke in, in the eighties. Can you talk about the different decades and eras and the importance and styles of women's wrestling, as opposed to probably what 90% of the people listening to us are actually educated on. I mean, if you go back and you look at all Japan pro wrestling, which was the top promotion throughout a good chunk of the nineties, it was because of their Joshi. It was because of the women. It was because of women like Aja Kong and Monami Toyota. They were the ones that were actually drawing people into the buildings. People were paying to go see the women and the men were the supporting act throughout a, a good decade there inside of all Japan where it wasn't about the sex of the performer. It was just about the quality of work that was being put out. They just, that, that Joshi scene, those women that like group collective just absolutely reinvented. It was like the cruiserweight division in WCW. They just started it kind of at the bottom of the card and just worked their way up. It was an absolutely incredible organic thing to where you would have people like Monami Toyota in the main event because she was the best wrestler in the world for about a decade. It's hard to argue with, with the economy. But do a lot of people there. know who she is? That I was going to say that's one of the big draw. You know, drawbacks on this thing is is this one of those? Is if a tree falls in the woods, in eighty five percent of the world, you know, wrestling fans have never heard or seen anything. See, and, and I think that's one of those kind of situations where. Y- when you look at a list like this and, and Paz, you kind of bring up, you know, there's this whole list of Japanese women from about, you know, 1985 to about 2000, 2001, that just completely reinvented what Japanese pro wrestling and what the standard kind of was very much like what the junior heavyweights were doing in the 1994 super J cup, right. Where they were just lighting the world on fire. And I, I don't think people pay attention to it because of the language barrier. But when you start talking to people and you, you're really getting into, you're talking to people inside of the business. Monami Toyota is the name that always comes up and that she's the name that MVP re- simply replied to. You spelled Monami Toyota wrong. Like she, the people inside of the business Everybody recognizes Monami Toyota was just light years beyond everybody else. Now, now with Toyota, we're talking performer. And you know what I mean? I'm going to go to every which angle I can and break down, you know, where, really, where your skills rank at here. How, and as you're, and you're t- saying, you know, she is the standout, the, the Ric Flair over there. She are- was the person putting asses in seats for a decade. That like okay so like <laughs> that 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 was when you talk about now, drawing money and, and I, and that I was know, Toyota. And I know it's a lot different in the strategies that they employ over there, and, and just really the perception of, of from entertainment to to actual sport. Um, uh, how was she with with like the fans? Like her interaction when she had to do press, or you know if she was away from the arena at, at a festival, at a parade, or whatever the big occasion might be because they celebrate things so differently over there. Uh, How was that connection? I mean, it's interesting because Toyota, you know this very much. So like the, the heel and baby face thing in Japan is kind of a a, a different concept because it is a much more sports-like presentation, right? So the thing with Toyota was you would get invested in her when she was on the chase. And then when she would win the championship, it was a matter of who is going to be able to defeat her, right? So she could play either way, and then the crowd would feel either way because you want to see somebody defeat the champion in Japanese pro wrestling. That's the way it works. People enjoy the chase, and the reign is more about who's going to beat them because they're always pulling for that underdog challenger. 
Toyota could play the best of both worlds. And when she would get on top, everybody knew that she was on top for a reason because she was just that much better. What about Medusa? Where does she I rank? Had, I just had her. I flipped to her stuff. I knew. I knew you were getting to her. Uh, I, you know, Medusa, incredible talent. Uh, a, a thrill seeker in every sense. And I think she just got that high, that adrenaline rush off of the audience is going out there and perform. I think, you know, when it came to those outside tangibles of, you know, outside of the bell to bell, good. She can handle herself. Uh, I think she had good personality. I think she understood, you know, how to represent what Medusa, Medusa stood for. Uh, even, you know, when she had to go with that, what, what was she, under Blaze at one yeah. point? Uh, I think she did a tremendous job, but I think what really hurts her is that, as we had mentioned earlier, where maybe you had in Western wrestling, essentially the women's business was killed, put to a standstill there uh, by the greediness of Mula. It was what those shambles were kind of left to be carried by Medusa, and there just wasn't a whole lot there. Yeah, there, there wasn't a whole lot of talent for Alundra Blaze to work with, for Medusa to work with. But when you talk about her significance in pro wrestling history, her showing up in WCW and throwing the belt in the trash might be like one of the top five wrestling moments of all time, right? Like just the influence. And then like, I always enjoyed her more when she was working down south because it was she got to be herself. You know what I mean? Like she wasn't bowing to Vince and Vince's BS, even inside of the WWE. Like she was the only one that really felt legit in an era where the women just were not taken seriously on the WWF roster. And the only thing I, that I would kind of counter, counter the women's title in the trash can, the significance behind that moment, Sure, it was, oh, my God, you know, that's a WWE championship. It, 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 that was more about the power struggle and the play and the promotions than anything about women's wrestling. I mean, essentially, what it, it, you talk about another moment where you just pretty much kill women's wrestling. It's set it them back stopped at, that, at that point right there. Yep. You know, if she would have, you know, shown up and and then maybe she throws that in the trash and then reveals a new brand new world championship wrestling women's you know title and says you know what we're here they didn't care about this we were a joke sideshow over here i'm here they say we're this is where the big boys play well mama's got a table now and we're going to see who's going to step up to it that would have been an opportunity there that would have been something truly tremendous as we're sitting here talking about the history of women's wrestling uh, but that was just more for shock value what about sherry martell where does she rank i'll come in hot on this one and this is where you know i kept asking you are we talking about wrestlers or are we talking about performers and sherry was one of those that is in the same era as medusa uh she is is trained by mula but they have a falling out because they, they have a difference it really because sherry didn't want to go by mula's rules she didn't want to play that game and she had she embraced you know then the the party side of professional wrestling she liked to go out and enjoy herself and, bar and partake in, in the, the party favors, if you will. Uh, but to me, I, Sherry's right up there near the absolute damn top of this list. And we're looking at it, all of the tangibles and what she could bring to the ring. She was extremely marketable, uh, I mean, beyond beautiful in the time. Uh, she had the gift of gab. The persona was absolutely incredible. She could go 100% with any woman in the world. She could get in there with a man, bell to bell, go toe to toe. We're talking about one of those, when we talk about tremendous great managers of all time, I believe she's overlooked because she was a female. But what she did was absolutely magnificent. Anyone's corner that she was in, she absolutely elevated. And she did so because she was almost, she was an extension of whoever she was representing. And you go back, and, and it's hard to believe, like, how the hell could you elevate the macho man at that point? She absolutely did. You, you go back and you watch some of those matches, especially uh, with him and where, because we've we done a watch along with that. 
And it, it, it was insane. I mean, she is an extension of everything that Macho is doing. She's part of the movie. She's like another limb. And it, it, her, her body language, her emotions, simple, her placement, her presence with the camera, it just it adds 1,000% to everything that's going on into that moment. Across the board, she she did that for everyone. It'd be it'd be Harlem Heat, it'd be Diviasi, Shawn Michaels. She was simply incredible. Uh, absolutely one of the best performers. Period in the history of professional wrestling. I don't think it can be understated how important she was to those early days of Shawn Michaels either. Like she was absolutely vital in getting Shawn Michaels over as a main event performer. Yeah. What what about some kind of current day, but not, not so current day, not active right now, but what about Lita and Trish Stratus? What do they rank on your list? I think in an era that was defined by the bra and panties match, Lita and Trish kind of inspired that entire next generation of what we see now, that women's wrestling could be bigger, it could be better that they could actually go out there, they could main event Monday Night Raw, that they could go out there and wrestle just as good as the guys do in an era where that was just not the case in any way, shape, or form. And it was Trish and Lita that absolutely established that, and the fans went along with it because they had everything. They were the complete package, and especially together, the two of them, whether it be as partners or against one another, they just had that chemistry that the fans got behind it until it actually got pushed as a real program on WWF TV. I, th- I don't think that their influence can be understated at all. Yeah, I, I think, you know, just especially in professional wrestling, but life in general and traveling two different paths, Lita and Trish and how they came up together, mirrored each other are tremendous inspirations for, for young women of, of, of all generations uh you know you have lita who who really had this drive to get into professional wrestling but there there wasn't a, an easy path at this time we're talking about the stalls the stops the major companies really just wrestling as a whole not wanting to give it a major opportunity to give those divisions a big investment the chance you're more of that sideshow so she hits the indie circuit she she's out there making the town she is clawing her way up to the top and whatever she has to and, and she gets that opportunity and she knows that, you know, give me the ball, I'll run with it. I'm going to work my ass off to become someone up that everyone in this business looks towards as a great performer. Trisha, on the other hand, was one of those first uh, model magazine picks up, correct? I mean, she came in, remember how just God awful. Uh, but you have to admire the passion and the drive. And then she eventually says, you know what? It's in her own personality. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to be called, I'm, I'm going to work my damn ass off to become good and then she exceeded that uh probably beyond everyone's wildest you know imagination of what the hell she was going to be able to achieve i and i think both of them are just inspirational stories and they stood out amongst their pack and and right around them if it be those that shared the ring or kind of came before just before them again there was some some tough tough women that got the business that could work the angles that could do it all. What about China? China's kind of an interesting one, right? I mean, because when when we talk about people like Becky Lynch, like we talk about Becky Lynch got herself over. Was there ever a woman that was more over than China? I mean, like as part of DX, with the number of eyeballs that were watching Monday night raw, the feud with Jericho, the Intercontinental title, it's just the way that China was pushed during the Attitude Era, how she was such a featured attraction on the show. Was there ever anybody more over than China? Possibly not, yeah. Uh, I, I would agree with that, but I, you know, also, I have a lot of questions. Sable, maybe? Over. Maybe Sable was more over? Oh, yeah, Sable, that's a good one. Well, I mean, that could be argued, Sable. too. Uh, Sable, Sunny, and they're all for different reasons. Uh, as we're talking about just over, uh, China's an, an interesting conversation for me. She was over. That's undeniable. 
uh, and you know, just recently she, you know, her, her story comes to the surface again, as we get the kind of disturb, uh, not just kind of very disturbing <laughs> documentary, right. you know, rough at times to kind of to sit through and you just look at somebody that, that comes into a, a very vicious industry of professional wrestling that already has issues, uh, already dealing majorly with the self-confidence, the body issues. And you look real early into that and you kind of wonder, and, and I know that, that Vince Russo booked her to the, you know, he saw tremendous things in her value, loved her as a person. Uh, but beyond that, you know, other people at the influence, a lot of the stuff, was she used in a ribbing sense? I mean, even as the bodyguard, John Michaels and Triple H need a female body. No matter how she looks, you know, is that part of the, the DX stick? You know, it's, it's, you're supposed to kind of laugh at that in a sense. Well, I mean, I think that's how it started. But then the fans took interest in the character and forced the company to make her something more than that. You know what I mean? Like, well, it, it, I think you know maybe in a sense where there was there were aspects of it where they thought it was a rib, and you know they're popping themselves. Uh, but really, you have the the evolution of the smirk at this point. Mm -hmm. So people are starting to see through things like that, and if you kind of sense that maybe it, it, a lot of people probably saw a, a lot of themselves in China, where you know they look a little different than the norm. They don't, she doesn't look like the other females there. She, right. she handles herself a little different. And not even, you know, if you feel that way as an individual, and we're talking about an era of wrestling where people were really latching on to these different personas and, and really living vicariously through them. And she represented that for a lot of people. Maybe you don't look like the norm. You feel a little different at times. You're not the standard so people would rally behind things like that. And I think that's where they really believed in China. Now, you know, they hear some of the things that, you know, that, that she wanted to pay, you know, on the same level of stone cold. I mean, it just seems that, that the business just began to, to eat her alive. Uh, I've heard multiple, multiple insiders talking about this. She looks so much better with the guys because she she had to wrestle them because the guys could move her, they could carry her. They were you know they were the right dance partners. Where the fe other females at that time they couldn't, so it made her matches right. look really awkward. And, and so they had to make that transition. So at that point, you got to start you know moving up that card. Uh, I, I think she, I, amongst the best, I don't have her near the top. I just also had like Awesome Kong, Luna Vachon, Gail Kim, of course, Leilani Kai I had on my list, Akira Hokuto I had on my list. I uh, even threw out there just for the potential. Obviously, she wasn't, but could have been Ronda Rousey. I just threw her on there for potential. Natalia Nightheart. But uh, is there anybody that we kind of omitted or Booker, missed? Booker T just, uh, you know, is kind of what prompted this conversation with us is some people speaking out booker t said natalia the greatest wwe female wrestler of all time uh one of the things that jumped out there too that, that she said there pause is we're talking about china knowing how to work those styles being able to work with the other females man awesome kong she could do that yep uh you know with that perception of that that, that difference and that power she could go out there and and, and let's do another great mention here who I think across the board incredible, uh, one of Kong's best dance partners, Gail Kim. Yep. Anybody I, Chargo, at, at number four on my list, and you brought up Kong, you brought up Gail Kim. I'm also going to include the beautiful people. I'm also going to include Madison Rain. Like that entire 2005 to 2010 ish impact knockouts division in an era where the WWE was all about the fashion models and it was all about the gimmick matches before the women's evolution revolution, whatever you want to call it, that impact knockouts division was some of the best wrestling on the planet, male or female. And I think that anybody that was in that division at that time deserves a shout out on this list. So I put the entire impact knockouts division well, at number four on my I'll, list. I'll ask, I'll, I want to turn and ask you guys this, Pons, I'll kick it over to you. Uh, was that division the best women's division in professional wrestling history? 
I I would say in the United States in North okay. America for, for what yeah for most what the, our listeners what we're talking yeah about. for what I'm familiar with probably yeah yeah, yeah. no doubt about and, it and a lot of that goes to your boy Dutch right I mean he was his the idea yep. there that, that yep. he understood there's there's something unique here now is he does he ever talk to you the because you know over on realm now and association with Hameen Media uh, brand management uh, the beautiful people you know they credit so much of where they're at with Russo is Dutch ever talked to you about the interaction with, with Russo in when it came to, to working with the women's divisions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Once they started rolling, Russo was on board is basically what he said. Like it wasn't his idea, but once he got to work with them, he loved working with them. He worked, he excelled with them. He did great with them, but it wasn't his idea. It was like Dutch's idea. And he kind of latched onto it. Basically, so how, what Dutch, how, Dutch was it, how was it when Dutch goes and sells this? Because, you know, we're talking about a time where, I mean, they made a ser they made more of a serious push than any major company in the West that we'd seen at that point. It was basically like prove us right or prove us wrong, you know. But let let's see what you got, Dutch. Let's see that your your great idea. I, I here, could right? see that for TNA at the time. They're like, all right, we need something, <laughs> Dutch. Yeah, just right. try. Yep. Hey, man, we're we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna lob you we're gonna lob you a couple pitches. If you can hit a few out of the park here, <laughs> you're good to go with it. And, and and the two biggest hits that Impact had at that time, at least for me were the X division featuring a bunch of wild and crazy kids on the come up. Like, you know, that crazy kid, AJ styles and the impact knockouts division. I mean, that knockouts division was just absolutely fantastic at that time. Um, a couple other names that I wanted to throw out. Number one is Paige. If Paige hadn't gotten injured, I think that she may end up have ended up, you know, top 10 on this list because I think that she was that good. And Rick, you and I have had this conversation and we might actually get heat for this conversation, but the Bella twins belong on this list as well, because what the Bellas did for women's wrestling in the past 25 years whether you love them or whether you hate them, women's wrestling wouldn't be where it is right now without the Bella Twins. Yeah, we're, and we're talking about performers, and it, that goes into at so many avenues, so many different aspects. And it's a harsh pill for so many fans to swallow. Right now, the Bella Twins are more over than 95, and that might be generous towards the active roster, towards the WWE roster. They're, they have they're more notoriety. They have crossover regularly talking about get outside of the bubble this business needs to grow an audience and like it or not they do that for sure so as we wrap it up here who is jargo who is the greatest women's wrestler i think i know where you're leaning but who's the greatest women's wrestler of all time monami toyota hands down and if i had to pick a number two it would be mildred burke if i had to pick a number three as a, far as like people that our listeners would be like okay yeah i i know who that person is i've seen that person's matches number three i would put gail kim rick who you got you know, I, I got this down to, to two right now. Uh, before I jump into that, I want to give some shout out to some up and comers. Uh, there, there are some tremendous, uh, incredible watches to get involved with in women's wrestling out there. Uh, one, uh, a, f a friend of ours, family, if you will. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you've seen her. She's she's picking up steam like crazy right now in the NWA's genocide. Uh, power, character, beauty. You, she's total package. She's got it going on there. Uh, you might have caught her on dark. She is she's hungry for this thing. She she is a tremendous athlete. She's finding her persona right now, working through some character stuff uh, based here out of Cincinnati. Uh, star student, fiance uh, of Cody Hawk. Uh, talk about Shauna Reed. Keep her out for her. Incredible. Her sister, uh, who is my go to female for the PWA Haley Shadows. I got to continue going here. Ariel Alexander. My favorite, my favorite person to ring announce for, Aria Alexander. I, I love ripping off those, those double ways, but she's down at OVW doing great things there. Keep your eyes on, on all of those talents there. Uh, but for me, this comes down to two. My runner-up is going to be for best female performer in pro wrestling history. My runner-up is going to be Gail Kim, uh, but I, I'm going to stick with this thing. I'm going Sherry Martell. Interesting. Okay. Uh, as far as me, I don't know. I, I really had a tough time because Toyota is such a good wrestler, 
but for whatever reason, I, I just kept coming back to Fabulous Mool. I don't know why. I guess that's the perception. I guess I was, you know, thinking that, but I kept coming back to Mool. I don't know why. I, and I guess that's just the way that they beat it into my head for all those years that she was the greatest. But for yep. some reason to me, I got to go Mula. Um, just, just she was the first name I thought of. And, and that's, I don't know, just, I guess that was beaten into my head. It was the first name I wrote down. And before I even started writing down other names, I'm like, damn, Mula, I guess is probably the greatest and the most famous. The, it- you surprised me here, man. We're up against the clock, and I thought you were going to pull it out last minute. I thought you were going to say Brooke Hogan. Oh. <laughs> so let's head to the plugs on that note. Great, great one, Rick. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Check out the website, tmptempire.com. Of course, Patreon, patreon.com slash tmptempire. Jargo, what do you got? You can keep up with me across social media platforms at not Jargo. And if you want to watch some amazing women's wrestling, head over to stardom dash world.com as stardom prepares for their version of the G one climax, the five star grand prix. It will showcase the finest in all of women's wrestling going down. It starts this Saturday round Robin style tournament. Um, and then you can listen to destino, a new Japan pro wrestling podcast where I'll be covering the stardom five star grand prix and as we march toward uh, another dome show, Huckleberry just dropped out. He was like, oh, yeah, screw it. I don't even want to talk to these guys yeah. anymore. As we march towards another dome show and, of course, the G1 Climax. Nice. Good stuff. And, of course, RBV. You can follow him at the real RBV <laughs> on Twitter and Instagram. Oh, no, he's back. Okay, I was going to say, I was just doing your plugs for you. All right, what do you got for plugs, RBV? Look, I, I try to go get the exact date. Is it, Jargo's putting over women's events. Want to check things out. I wanted to make sure I got the exact date. So I think it is the 28th, Foz. You can probably correct me on that, for NWA Empower, uh, which is going to be their women's pay-per-view. Uh, so you're going to check that out. All those tremendous names. The great crop. You're going to have Genocide there. Mickey James running the show. Thunder Rosa. The Viotro. The, the, the so Diana Perazzo from, from Impact going to be there. They've got names across the board here. That's going to be there. So that's coming up. Empower. NWA Empower. Hey, but for us, you know, all the HMG stuff over on the Patreon. Everything going on at Realm. Keep up with me personally across all social media at The Real RBV. Nice, great stuff as always, boys. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll see you right back here next week for Who Is? <laughs>